But I don't. I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. And I'm James. This is our pre US Open episode, our US Open preview slash Cincy wrap. Yeah, we have a massive agenda this week. Uh, before we get into that, thank you to the people we bullied into giving us reviews. Mm -hmm. It is much appreciated. I did want to address one small thing, make mm -hmm. a correction, and also a non correction. Okay. To the gentleman who asked about Jack Shu, we do in fact know his name is not Jack Shu. It is just a terrible joke that that we say. Mm -hmm. We do know his name is Jack Sock. However, thank you for correcting me. Ruse is not Italian. She is Romanian. So fair play on that one. Typically this time of year, we would have just come back from Cincinnati. We didn't go last year. Last year it was actually in New York City, but... I think from 2015 through 2019, we've been in Cincinnati every year. Mm -hmm. It's honestly a, a good time for us. We, we quite enjoy it. Yeah. Last year was weird because I was just kind of content being at home. But this year I really missed it mm -hmm. because more people were there. It was back on the Cincinnati site in Mason, Ohio. And it felt more like the real tournament. Now, to be clear, I probably would not have traveled because of COVID, and I don't want to be around that many people, but there was a little bit of sense of uh, missing out this year. Probably wouldn't have traveled? Well, you didn't. You had the opportunity to. Well, yeah, you so, you did not have the opportunity. No, I could. I could have flown there. Oh, that's I true. I couldn't, couldn't have driven there because mm -hmm. of the weird border rules right now. Yes, and our different citizenship statuses yeah. in different countries. <laughs> but it wasn't even a conversation we had. It, no, no, no. That was like... Uh, I mean, we're like, we're just dipping our toe in uh, going out to restaurants, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> We've been locked down for a long time in Toronto, so it is, it takes a while to sort of rev up again. Yeah, we get a, quite a few questions from time to time about what our tennis schedule is for the rest of the year. And we, like Serena, like Roger, like <laughs> Venus... Like who else? Like Stan, it seems. We are taking the rest of the year off. Yeah, we're... We are not injured, but we will not be on the tennis circuit for the rest of the year mm. because of COVID. The Rogers Cup happened in Toronto. I considered going to one session on the Wednesday when it looked like we would have gotten a Felix and Rafa day session. And even when that was on offer, I was like, eh... Like, is it is it worth it? Is it you worth can, the exposure? Right. You can only go to the main stadium. Nothing else was open to spectators, which is most of the fun, is mm -hmm. the rest of the grounds at any tournament. Yeah. And it was just like, uh, it's still COVID. Yeah. And so when Rafa pulled out, that was such an... E I'd, I'd already decided not to go before, but when he did pull out, I felt better about it. Mm -hmm. Sadly for Rafa, <laughs> he had to pull out... But that made my feelings about the matter easier. Right, right. Now, I do want to say there has been a lot of Cincinnati slander and defense mm -hmm. in the past few weeks. And first of all, it's not nice to drag somebody's hometown. No. It's just not, right? But is it okay to drag an entire state? Because Ohio is not a fun state. It's, I got to say, it's not my favorite. However... There's got to be some sort of interesting cultural anthropology of spending time in an American suburb if you're not American, right? Mm -hmm. I would think you may not love it, but it's a, it's an experience. You mean like the time in 2019 when you, me, and Chad, recently suspended CC Smooth 13, were in a <laughs> suburban Ohio bar and felt really unsafe oh that time? God, that was weird because... You're like a mile away from Cheesecake Factory, but it honestly felt like a whole different planet. Yeah. It felt uh, very unsafe. We've been to multiple weddings of your friends <laughs> during the summers of, what, 20, 2008, 2009, 
we went to like three or four weddings in Ohio. And one particular trip, we went to a bar afterward in the middle of nowhere. And we were just like, we are leaving right this minute. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, to the people who say, oh, it's such a lame place. Like, who wants to go to Applebee's? The players have nothing to do. Like, okay, not not everywhere is Paris, okay? Mm -hmm. Not everywhere can be Rome. The actual tournament site is excellent yes. it provides an incredible fan experience the level of competition you get the level of access to players and proximity to players is amazing i think you really have to value what you have at a tournament like cincinnati if you're there for the tennis you can hardly do better it's one of the only spots in north america where you get the men and women playing at the same time at the same venue outside of say, the U.S. Open, I guess, Miami and Indian Wells, right? Mm -hmm. Those are three, I guess you would say, bigger cities, more interesting cities than Mason, Ohio. Fine. But they are also infinitely more inaccessible and more expensive. Yeah. You can actually find cheap places to stay around Mason. The food options have improved immensely. Mm -hmm. I mean, they blow Toronto out of the water, mm -hmm. which is sad because of the cuisine that's accessible in yeah. Toronto. The volunteers are nice. Like, it is just a good experience. The last time we, we intended to go to Miami before the pandemic hit, we were looking at places to stay. That was just wild, the cost. You could have stayed in, in Cincinnati three times over for the duration of that <laughs> yes. tournament. And also, the cost of a week-long pass to go to Cincinnati is so affordable. The last time I checked, it was something like, seven eight hundred dollars for the entire tournament that's pretty damn good value it is so before we move on to the cincinnati results let's recap the very end of canada because we released an episode i think uh the day before the final camila georgie surprised everyone by reaching her first 1000 final and beating carolina pliskova this was actually her first final above the international level on the wta tour daniel medvedev beat Riley Opelka. This is his 12th title already in his young career. Well, not actually not super young, but still 12 titles is a lot. It's his third this year. He's basically run the gamut in that whole American hardcourt swing. Mm -hmm. He has a bunch of titles from that. His output on hardcourts is next to Djokovic at this point. Like over the course yeah. of their careers. Over the past few years. Nadal's hardcourt record is criminally underrated. But as far as how the current setup of the tour is now, Daniil Medvedev is a clear number two on hard courts. But for Georgie, what you saw in Montreal was just how immense her talent is, right? Like we've mm -hmm. seen spurts of this kind of performance from her before and always wondered, well, well, damn, if she's ever able to put it together, what would that look like? And we saw what it looked like in Montreal. She had a, a difficult draw. Like, this is a draw you might encounter in a Grand Slam tournament, beating Mertens, Kvitova, Goff, Pagula, and Pliskova in the final. Mm -hmm. It was not an easy run there. Camila, man, she is an eccentric character. She and her dad are, like, on their own little plane over there. She's got her lingerie thing. She's got her Instagram baddie thing going on. Like, she simply does what she wants. She clarified her comments about, I don't follow tennis, I don't follow woman tennis, <laughs> after she won that title. And she was saying, well, when I'm not on the court, I, I just don't care about tennis. I'm not watching. Tennis is one thing. And then when I'm at home, I'm trying on dresses, I'm doing the Instagram thing. She has a very clear work-life balance, it seems. <laughs> yes. And that's something to be admired, frankly. Mm-hmm. The comments were hilarious at the time when she said, I don't follow woman tennis. Her clarification actually makes a lot of sense. When you're in a tournament, you're super dialed in, you're there to play. And when she's off, she's off. And in her tennis career, when she's off, she's really off. <laughs> but she was on and really on yeah, at this tournament. Yeah. A Pliskova it has been the perennial bridesmaid this year. Like, her career has really come back to life, but... Not a bridesmaid? <laughs> Nini, come on. <laughs> but runner-up at Wimbledon, runner-up at Rome. Like, she's had great results. 
but again, she loses in a final. Mm-hmm. However, she turned it around and she beat Jesse Pagula in Cincinnati. Yes. After having lost to her four times already this year, mm-hmm. we talked previously on the last episode about how different her year could have looked from a now pretty decent one to a pretty stellar one had she not played Jessica Pagula <laughs> at all in 20. 20- 21. Right, right. After being out of the top 10, now she's back to number four. And gosh, who knows? She might be number two if Pagula didn't get in her way. And now heading into the U.S. Open, these are two players that you just have to be keeping an eye on. We'll we'll talk about some of the other players that you should be keeping an eye on. But Georgie, Pliskova, Pagula, they're right up there. Mm-hmm. Now moving on to Cincinnati, I feel like this week came and went so quickly that it was hard to keep up with the actual tennis. It's the end of the summer. You're trying to fit things in. (laughs) You know, it's been beautiful weather here in Toronto, and we've had, like, very little chance to enjoy it. But Cincinnati gave us another Ash Barty tournament win, her fifth of the year. Another Ash Barty masterclass. And at this point, you know, Barty has a pretty big lead as number one is the most informed player moving into the U.S. Open. Over 3,000 points. Right, and has excelled on all surfaces so far this year. She could fail to defend a slam and a half worth of points and still be in good stead. (laughs) (laughs) In this tournament, she was very close to double bageling Victoria Azarenka. The score was so bad for most of the match that people were tuning in and saying, like, what is going on? Like, is something wrong? She beat... Roland Garros champion Krejcikova, who has kept her her form at a very high level since winning the French. See, that was the match that really impressed me. Mm. Because Krejcikova has not budged one inch since winning the French Open. She's maintained her level. She is a top 10 WTA player firmly right now. And And the type of player with a lot of variety to match Ash Barty. But not on this day. No. She also beat Angie Kerber, who's been playing well lately. Now, Jill Teichman, not to be overshadowed here. She got to the final. Teichman came into Cincinnati with a wild card. And then she beats Naomi Osaka, the number two seed. The recent Olympic gold medalist, Belinda Bencic. The runner-up in Montreal, Karolina Pliskova. And falls to only Ash Barty in the final. Mm -hmm. You may recall Teichman had... A hell of a run at some point in the recent past. That's how I kind of thought about it, without being able to call it immediately from memory. Right. right? It was like, I remember she won one or two tournaments two years ago, and she was really on the rise, right? Not even that specific. I was just like, (laughs) I know she's had some really good results recently, but of course the pandemic kind of breaks all that up in Mm. in your memory, right? But in 2019, she had this strong spring into summer, where she won Prague and Palermo. And then this year, she reached semifinals in Dubai after having beaten Kvitova, Jabur, and Goff. She had been as high as number 40 before, and she's now currently number 44. So this is somebody who has been able to recapture the trajectory of her career. I hesitate to say post-pandemic, because we are nowhere near being post-pandemic. But in terms of Tennis being back on track, yes. Right. And, I mean, add her to the very long list of dark horses at the U.S. Open. The women are still playing, you know, best two out of three. So it's a very similar format. And, I mean, we have we have learned not to count anyone out on the women's side at the majors. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's go back to Ash for a second, because I want to bang on this drum some more. <laughs> Just a little bit more. You know, we've been Ash Barty partisans since, like, I don't know, 2016? You know, whenever she started making noise as a player before her retirement? Yeah, but it really came in full force for us when we interviewed her in Cincinnati. Yeah. That was a highlight of our quote-unquote careers (laughs) (laughs) as tennis podcasters. And to watch her career flourish since then, it's... um. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. And we we saw her ascend to world number one. We saw the pandemic halt the tennis tours. 
we saw Ash stay at home upon resumption in the summer of 2020 and said, you know what? I'm good. I'm going to stay here. I am going to go to the footy. I'm going to get real pumped up. Y'all are going to take pictures of me pumping my fists. I'm having a good time. Tennis can wait. And in the meantime, a lot of folks had a lot to say, saying that, well, why isn't she on tour? What is she doing? Blah, 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 blah. And then when she came back, the usual crap about her not being a true number one, saying that she's boring, saying that her game is boring. And well, all Miss Barty has done since is win. <laughs> right. She's won five titles this year. She's made six finals. The only one she lost was in Madrid to Sabalenka. And these titles are big ones. Huge ones. Wimbledon, uh, Stuttgart, a prestigious clay tournament, she's, Miami, she's winning Cincinnati. Them, <laughs> she's winning them on all surfaces. <laughs> right. Clay at the French Open, Wimbledon on grass, Miami, Cincinnati on hard courts. And in this most recent stretch, she's doing it without going home. Mm-hmm. She's, been, she's going to be on the road for eight months without being able to go home because of the quarantine rules in Australia. This is immense. We hear everybody on tour complaining now about the bubble life and how or rightly so. I mean, it's just a fact. It's difficult to play tennis in a pandemic and have to go through bubbles regardless of how porous they are. It's not your typical tour life. It's hard. And mm-hmm. then when you have to go through that and your only connection to home is coffee beans in the mail or a Zoom call for eight months, that makes it even more difficult. Right. So, you know, a lot of the Australian and probably Asian players are going through this and they go through it to some degree every season because they're away from home so frequently, but it's really difficult to get back now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's very subjective how you as a fan respond to someone's personality and game. So if Ash's game is not electrifying to you, that's a perfectly valid position. If her personality just doesn't jump out at you, also valid, but it's getting very difficult to argue that she's not a true number one, right? At this point, she is one of the more consistent number ones of the past five, six, seven years. Easily. Easily. It's it's so great how quickly we've been able to move past this questioning her as number one, in part because of the frozen rankings. People are like, well, right. if the rankings were normal, well... Brothers and sisters, cousins, <laughs> friends, audience, <laughs> all that is moot at this point. Yeah. As a fan, I'm so glad she was able to preempt that that conversation mm-hmm. because it's not the old points that are keeping her afloat now. She's got another major. She's got Cincinnati. She's got Miami. She- <laughs> She's going to be number one for a long time Yeah, because these points keep on a coming. And we're closing in on 100 weeks at number one not there yet but she will probably get there and that's less those weeks when the tour was shut down it's Mm -hmm. not counting those weeks it's a lot let's also be clear part of this whole barty's game being boring and barty being boring is because folks only really ascribe entertainment value to women's tennis and sport in so much as they can bring the drama and the mess. And Ash is just not about that life. No, not at all. I mean, when when you see her at a tournament and in press, like, she's just all business. The press may not be her favorite thing in the world, but she comes, does her job professionally, and you get what you get. Like, I feel like Ash is very straightforward. She's super polished, and... uh I mean, how many times do you see folks talking about, oh, that's a popcorn match, that's a popcorn match in the WTA? And it's usually involving scammers. <laughs> no, now don't paint all WTA fans with the same brush because it's there are usually... so many who are really astute tennis watchers. Sure, you know? but it also often involves mess mongers. <laughs> <laughs> that's certainly part of it. And listen, I love mess too. Listen, even but... when it's our faves... Like the Williamses or whatever, a lot of the times people get amped up when there's a lot of mess involved mm-hmm. as well. You know, like this is an opportunity for us to to look at the reasons why we watch women's, women's tennis and what, what it is that we're looking to get out of it. Mm-hmm. Are we watching it just for the tennis or something else? 
And are we also taking that same lens to how we watch men's tennis? Right. Are we watching men's tennis in Nadal for the power of his strokes, the banana forehand, the craft of his game? Or are we watching it for other reasons? It, I, I find that it tends to be an imbalance. Yeah. And it can be it can be extended to other sports as well. It's kind of a through line. And one of the reasons why women's sport suffers compared to men's sport. And all the while folks tell us, well, it's it's the numbers. Mm-hmm. Well, we are going to talk about this a bit later, but look at the Prefontaine Classic uh, over the weekend where the same three Jamaican sprinters went one, two, three again. Uh, Elaine Thompson is closing in on the world record that was previously thought to be unapproachable. Mm -hmm. And who was the first person interviewed? You know, this was billed as Shikari Richardson's return. The way that women's sport is covered leans heavily on the drama. And I understand that's sport in general. But I think as sophisticated fans on tennis Twitter, way more sophisticated than us, people who love tennis for the technique and the stats and all that, they're doing a great service to women's tennis because they're looking at it as a sport, Mm -hmm. not as a play. You know, not as a drama. All that is to say, big up yourself, Ash Barty, because you're doing big things. What else happened in Cincinnati? This feels like ages ago, but Naomi Osaka's first press conference in Cincinnati made international news, as could be expected. Mm -hmm. Well, could be expected, but also aided by a lot of salacious reporting on the press conference. Because the press conference happened... We weren't there, but reading about it on Twitter, you got at least five different (laughs) takes on what happened. Very different readings on the same events. Mm -hmm. You You had folks who weren't there, but then went and watched it and came back to report a whole bunch of mess about it as well. Right. So we finally got to see the video, and what happened was a reporter from the Cincinnati Inquirer asked Naomi a question about how she doesn't like the press conference format, but she essentially needs the media to sort of promote her businesses and stuff like that. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the most tidily worded question, and Naomi actually did ask it to be rephrased, because I think she wanted some clarification. And she made a good faith effort to answer the question. Which she always does when she's in press. The moderator was like, do you need a minute? She's like, no, no, it's fine. I, 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 this is interesting. Mm -hmm. So she, she did answer the question and then it moved to Courtney Nguyen to ask a a different question. And it was clear that Naomi was tearing up Mm -hmm. and she started crying. So she. I mean, what a totally shit position as a reporter to find yourself in. Right. And Courtney actually started her question with sorry, because she clearly saw what was happening. Uh-huh. So Naomi did leave the room. And these were uh-huh. going to be innocuous, one of the mill tennis questions. Right. You know, the, the, the day-to-day, like, what's going on with your game kind of stuff. <laughs> right. So Naomi left. She did come back. Uh, she answered questions in Japanese. And the way this was reported, I mean, it was from TMZ. It was from... Uh, tennis reporters who you're familiar with, but it was picked up internationally as Naomi Osaka is moved to tears in her first press conference back. And her agent didn't really do anyone any favors. No. He released a blistering statement about how that reporter from the Inquirer was a bully, and this is what we're talking about, this is why she doesn't want to do press... And when you go back and listen to the question and the delivery, absent of any context, it feels like a reporter asking a question to me. It feels like somebody who's used to being in like a basketball locker room asking any old question would present. Right. And I feel that the tennis press is because it's such a niche sport and because you see the same kind of press core at a lot of the tournaments, it's it can be a very comfortable uh, situation for a lot of players. Clearly, clearly for Naomi, it's not. But Naomi does know a lot of these reporters personally. And the way that they deliver questions is probably different than just any sports reporter would. Mm-hmm. 
I just, I, I found it very unhelpful that Stuart, Naomi's agent, would say that that was bullying. Because I just really didn't get that. It wasn't. I know a lot of folks have, have said that, you know, the question was fine. There was nothing wrong with the question. I personally think the question was... Right, I don't think it was a great question. I think it was a daft question, <laughs> frankly. I thought it was a question that some that he probably thought was like, well, mm-hmm. well, what about this, ma'am? And in fact, there was a lot of false equivalence. There was a lot of not really understanding what's going on here with Naomi Osaka. Mm-hmm. Because Naomi Osaka does not need this tennis media. You're conflating media with tennis media. That's the thing. Tennis yeah. media is not... Vogue. And it's it's also not their job to promote Naomi's businesses. No. And right? so, so when he's presenting this idea that Naomi needs the press, there's this reflexive relationship that she needs it to then promote herself. Let's be clear about what press we're talking about. That's not this pre-tournament interview at the Western and Southern Open. Right. right. So you're throwing out this very loaded question that she's trying to make sense of, but it's in a way, nonsensical. Well, I think the the issue is that the question was loaded with assumptions that the interviewee has to either accept or cut through mm-hmm. in order to answer the question, right? The, and the a... proposition was, you don't like press conferences, but you need the press for this. And so how do you answer that question? Do you, do you accept the premise of the question or not? And she actually really tried to, to answer it. The fact that she started crying could, I mean, I don't know why. Like, that that could be any number of reasons. Mm-hmm. She said that she is struggling mentally, and we should believe her. I just, like, I don't like that some people painted a target on this guy's back. You know, that was unfair. Yes, I agree. But also, we shouldn't be looking to her response in press conferences as some grand indictment of, her relationship to press conferences or her own personal well-being. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, she's just and going through something right now. Exactly. Sure, and something happened at the French Open. Y'all know what that was. There's been a lot of talk about it because of who she is. But right now, like, she's going through something. She's trying her best to still go through the process and right. do it. And she came back. She answered more questions. She came back again after her match um and it was fine and she said she's really happy to be back on yeah. court and naomi moved on and we should move on she led us into her thinking about the whole thing the problem here was a the reporting about the initial press conference and b the agent because one of the things that continues to happen now and naomi i should think or i would hope would get on top of it is that this agent, Stu, whatever his name is, he's presenting her as somebody without agency. Yeah, so I I would really like to see her treated as an adult woman, mm-hmm. right? Like, I, I, just, I just can't imagine that she drove the drafting of that statement. Well, it happened so quickly after the press yeah. conference. It was like within minutes. I, I highly doubt it. But in the meantime, this dude is just running wild out there. At a certain point... She's also responsible for what he does. She's paying him. Right, of course. And again, she's an adult woman, so we do have to hold her to that standard as well if we're going by our own standard. But onto something a bit more lighthearted. It's rare that we can call something having to do with Yastrzemska lighthearted, but she played Katie McNally in Cincinnati. McNally is from the area, okay? If there's, <laughs> if there's two things anybody knows about Katie McNally, one is that you know about her probably because she partners Coco Golf in most doubles matches. Mm-hmm. And the other thing you probably know about her if you're in, <laughs> if you are a hardcore tennis fan is that you know she's from the Cincinnati area. Right. And that this tournament is her home tournament. Like she's been a thing there for years now. So the crowd was very much on her side, very vocal throughout this match versus Yastrzemska. When the match ended and Yastrzemska won, you know, she gesticulated and she's yelling at the crowd. She was really pissed off about how the crowd acted. And she just stomps over to her chair, doesn't shake or 
tap or gesture toward Katie. Blast by the umpire. <laughs> Katie goes over to like force a handshake or whatever. And you do not have to be a lip reading expert to know that Katie turned around and said, fucking bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, sometimes that's really all that's needed. Sometimes it's necessary. Listen, uh, pardon my French, by the way. I This does come with an explicit warning uh -huh. our episodes. I mean, you have to understand where Yastrzemska is coming from. When she, when her efforts to end global racism weren't met with the resounding applause that she expected, I mean, how else do you expect her to return to tour? Uh, after she was wrongfully accused of doping, she provided a very graphic depiction of how potentially mm. those performance enhancing drugs could have entered her system let's leave it there how about that point is there were many moves that she's made in the last year and a half that have not been met with the applause 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 that she lives for mm -hmm. do you remember when the most interesting thing about her was her non-stop medical timeouts i mean those still exist those still exist but there is i mean following yastramska is a wild ride mm -hmm. i think that's the conclusion here speaking of doping varvara lepchenko the american was popped for doping meaning that she was provisionally suspended after testing positive for metabolites of andrafinil and or modafinil in hungary i don't know if i'm pronouncing those drug names correctly please forgive me scientists andrafinil is a stimulant that is the active ingredient in uh, some supplements you can buy over the counter in some places used for alertness um it's in jet lag drugs it's in this thing i found called a brain formula so it is a stimulant it's non-amphetamine it's banned as a one of those non-specified stimulants that's the category so you know she'll go through the process right now she can't play she'll have to make her case you may remember she that she read her emails she, oh, those emails saved her ass mm -hmm. in 2016 she's the same person who was provisionally suspended around the same time as maria sharapova in early 2016 for testing positive for none other than meldonium now lepchenko was cleared at that time because she was able to show evidence that she stopped taking meldonium exactly 11 days before the end of 2015, when it was added to the banned substance list. However, casting no aspersions on her because she did not break a rule at that time, but having that previous positive test uh, is not making people feel very sympathetic this time. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have to talk about this next bit? <laughs> Listen, the men's side of Cincinnati is going to be very quick. Uh -huh, because it was won by that guy, and we'll have more to talk about that guy later on in the episode. I don't know if we talked about this before, but the recording of this episode is different to any other that we've done. We are recording it on consecutive nights. Yes, so this is part one. Uh, at this moment, we've just read Ben Rothenberg's second part of Olya Sharipova's story. We're going to read it again and give it the proper due. And, and report and record that part tomorrow. Yeah, uh, but you'll hear it in the same episode. But in the meantime... That guy beat Andrei Rublev in the final of Cincinnati. Rublev getting to that final was a breakthrough moment in and of itself for him. Unfortunately for him, it was a blowout. Yeah, Rublev beat his countryman Medvedev for the first time in six tries. The top four seeds made it to the semis here. Absent, you know, a few of the big names, the remaining top four made it. All of them are either Russian or of partial Russian descent. Mm -hmm. Fun fact. If you are finding it difficult to talk about that guy or refrain from talking about that guy because his results have been so good, use us as an example because we're moving on. <laughs> you really don't have to do it. No. Billie Jean King. Uh, I don't even want to go there. Like, the level of disappointing is really... It's not good for me right now. Billie Jean King is not out here at 77 years old scheduling tweets. 
on her Twitter. No. Like, she has a social no. media person, right? But at a certain point. I mean, at like, a certain point, you may have heard some rumbling that your social media person is hiding a bunch of replies. Wild. When I yeah. tell you, like, Billie Jean has this, or Billie Jean's social media manager, maybe they're they're charged with doing this. Maybe this is something that Billy has instructed must be done. But every notable achievement, past or present, must be commemorated by a Billie Jean King tweet. Mm-hmm. Like, if an ant ran the fastest ant race in history tomorrow, Billie Jean King will be congratulating that ant. <laughs> but regardless of whether it's her social media manager or whatever, that is your name behind, attached to those tweets. Your name and that has so much heft. This is the same Billie Jean King who is willing to counter Martina Navratilova and stand up for the rights of trans athletes, right? Mm-hmm. Like, she's trying to keep with the times. So I, I, I was really disappointed, but... Moving on, um, some Canadian content. Felix Oje Eliasim, he had a strong tournament. Yeah, I said on the last episode that he's struggling to put together <laughs> wins on hard courts, and he wins a couple here. Not so. Wins a couple. Beat Fuchovic, Hachanov, uh, number five, Matteo Berrettini. And he saved two match points in the second set against Stefanos, getting it to a third. The third one pretty quickly, but mm-hmm. he persevered. He was in some pain. He made it a match. Stephanos was accused of cheating. Yes, by that guy. Uh, so in the Felix match, we were watching it. Stephanos does his customary bathroom break after losing the second set, which I guess is just tradition at this point. Mm-hmm. Goes in the back, and then the camera sees his dad also in the tunnel. And so the commentators are like, oh. now Why the- is his dad in right. the tunnel? What made him have to leave his seat <laughs> to go to the tunnel The same path where Stefanos has crossed. Yes. So the commentators did not imply that anything fishy was going on. But the mere mention of saying that lets the listener and the viewer know where to make that leap. Because they were definitely like, huh? Now, in the next day, uh, he's in a semifinal against, you know, that German guy. And he is accused of cheating of texting with his dad while in the back. Now, there's no way for his opponent to know exactly Mm -hmm. what was going on in the back, but he said, oh, I saw Apostolos uh, texting while Stephanos was back there, and he took his phone because it was in his back. Okay. Um, Zverev would like to be believed. Does that sound familiar to you? Anyway, um, we have no idea what happened. This guy is not the best messenger for, mm-hmm. um, for like, matters of integrity. Mm-hmm. However... I mean, in this case, shoot the messenger. But at the same time, Tsitsipas has developed this unscrupulous reputation. Yes. I mean, his father regularly coaches him illegally during matches. Sometimes it's called, sometimes it's not. When you engage in this kind of shady behavior, you're going to get accused mm-hmm. of cheating. Okay, fine. You can't prove all this stuff. What we Mm -hmm. can prove, based on his own words, is the fact that Stefanos Tsitsipas has not taken the vaccine, has no desire to take the vaccine, unless he's mandated to take the vaccine. And his brother, Petros, I don't know if you saw this, but his social media stuff, you said to me today that, oh, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that Stefanos is anti-vax. No, no. But if it's a family thing... Last week, his comments said it didn't necessarily mean he was anti-vax. When he qualified those comments, it was very clear. Yes. And also taken together with the brother's social media output. Like, this is a whole mess of a family. Mm -hmm. And his dad said, I don't have to. We talk all the time about how tennis players are some of the most selfish athletes on the planet. We're seeing this play out with the vaccination stuff. (laughs) Yes. So let's just go through what was said first. In... Canada, when he was asked, he said he hasn't taken the vaccine because it hasn't been made mandatory and he didn't see the point. So at that point, I was like, well, that is terrible. However, it seems like he's not fundamentally opposed to Mm -hmm. the vaccine. He just simply does not care. But then now in Cincinnati, (laughs) he said, quote, the COVID-19 vaccine has not been tested enough because it is new and has some side effects. I know some people who've had them. I'm not against it. 
I just see no reason for someone in my age group to be vaccinated yet. For us young people, I think it's good to pass the virus because we'll build immunity. I don't see it as something bad. As I said, it isn't obligatory. Everyone has freedom to decide for themselves what's right and what's not. Mm -hmm. So several uh, mistruths there. The fact that it's better to build natural immunity we know is false. You can get reinfected with the disease and the immunity doesn't last very long. Uh, there's no reason for someone in my age group to be vaccinated. Obviously ridiculous because there are other people in the world. Um, uh, we've also heard what Grigor Dimitrov has to say about what his right. COVID experience was. There's no guarantee that if you are young and fit and healthy that you will not have a bad experience with COVID. Uh, these are things that we knew last summer, over a year ago. It's disappointing to see him just share these untruths. Mm -hmm. Now his dad when asked, decided he was going to make it even more stupid. He said, Athletes have a strong enough immune system to deal with any challenge that may arise. The resounding theme for me of the whole pandemic is... Me, 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 Right, me, me, it's me. like, how can I convince you that other people exist? Right? I mean, that's what even, folks like us want to do. Right? Even if, even if this athlete will not have a bad experience with COVID... Uh, there are other people in the world who you may pass it to. Do you feel any sort of responsibility for other people or no? What I loved was the quickness, the swiftness that the Greek government responded to this mess. <laughs> like in no time, they push back saying, don't listen to this fool. Basically saying he's not an expert and he should stop talking. <laughs> Literally, the spokesperson for the Greek government was like, no, no, no. I mean, this, this is a summation, not but it's not far from what the actual text was. They were they were nicer about it, but they were saying, Stephanos is an expert in something. Yeah, like, not this. He's an expert as an athlete in tennis. And a lot of y'all <laughs> listen to him because of that, and y'all shouldn't. <laughs> I mean... Come get your man. It was such a, such a 24 hours for him, because then... Uh, well, what? It was a week for him. Because mm -hmm. then he was accused of cheating. Mm -hmm. uh, no, and then shortly after this anti-vax stuff comes out, the Cincy tournament sends out a tweet with pictures of Stephanos in a pondering position. And he is, he's on the phone and he's looking all, what an ah. Uh. And then the, the caption for the tweet is, when you're trying to find the perfect words. And so this just brought back to light one of the other messes about Stefano Tsitsipas, the fact that he's a serial plagiarist, that he has <laughs> a nary, an original thought in his head. Do you ever and wonder... Way, but that's borne out again here because all this regurgitation of this anti-vax stuff is what we've seen everywhere. Yeah. I mean, do you ever wonder why Stephanos is not verified on Twitter? Oh God. I do. And I think it's because of that. No, he, I think because, he engages in bot-like behavior. Sure, but Twitter. it's also because he likes to be like a, a tennis hipster. You know, it would probably be uncool for him to be verified at this point. Regardless, the quote, perfect words remain elusive for Stefanovs. Meanwhile, Cincinnati, like many other tournaments this year, has made vaccines available to the players free of charge. And... Uh, you know, feasibly, they could take the vaccine first dose in Cincinnati, probably get a second dose in New York, if anyone is interested. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, it's commendable that the tournaments are offering this because, I mean, it's difficult if players are beholden to their own country to go back and get it. The U.S. Open allegedly will not be requiring proof of vaccination for fans with masks only mandated indoors. How does that gel with the New York State Va passport, uh, vaccination passport status. I now. don't know. So this is per David Waldstein from the New York Times. He reported today that the U.S. Open is not requiring proof of vaccination, unlike Indian Wells. This, honestly, I just really, really hope this is not a disaster in the making. This week in Winston-Salem, there was a, a bit of a kerfuffle about the lucky losers and the main draw. 
Nick Kyrgios pulled out at the 11th hour. He was slated to face Andy Murray. Obviously, this is a big ticket match mm-hmm. for Winston Salem. At night. Yeah. Noah Rubin is asked if he will play as a lucky loser against Andy Murray. Apparently, several other people had been asked and they declined. Noah had to take the court less than an hour after he lost his final qualifying match to play Andy. Uh, was know, it like nearly a three-hour match? Yeah. Long three sets? Uh, didn't Wasn't really able to put up much of a fight against Andy, but he took his place in the mm. main draw. He lost 6-2-6 six, love. And because of the rules around withdrawals now, uh, Nick, because he showed up to the tournament, because he didn't attempt to play his first round match and retire, he does get the prize money for the first round. Noah, as the lucky loser, does not get first round prize money, and he gets final round qualifying prize prize money mm-hmm. instead. Uh, you know, overall, I think most people agree this is actually a good rule because it removes the incentive for injured players to show up, play a few minutes, and retire, yeah. right? But with every rule, there are loopholes. There are things that can happen to make it unfair. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened at this tournament. Yeah. So where it gets annoying, and I can see how this can be frustrating if you're Noah Rubin, reportedly the two other players who declined the spot against Andy Murray, Herbert and Purcell, they were given lucky loser spots for seeded players who withdrew, and they got first round buys because the draw had already been made. So Basilashvili and Milman pulled out. Purcell and Herbert get a buy into the second round. Now, tell me, if you have declined an offer to move into the main draw, how are you allowed to? except the next best offer that comes around. How are you even eligible at that point? At that point, it's probably a matter of whoever is still on site. Right. That that sounds very sus to me, because that is a real question of fairness. Sure. Um, You were given an opportunity to go in the main draw. You said no. It's imperfect. Uh, It's clearly imperfect. (laughs) Now, we told you that this episode was being recorded in two parts on consecutive nights. This is the official start of the second part. (laughs) (laughs) Since this is a U.S. Open preview, it is incumbent on us to go through the draws. Now, we've printed them out on Thursday night. They could change before the tournament starts, but here is our best shot Mm -hmm. at looking through the draws. We're going to go through the draws, and then we're going to finish up with our thoughts on the second part of Olya Sharapova's story that was published yesterday in Slate Magazine, written by Ben Rothenberg. And then, as has been customary for our last few episodes, we're going to we're gonna come back to some track and field at the and end. We sure are, because there was even bigger, more exciting news today. Well, I don't know if it's bigger well, or more for exciting. Me, for me, okay. but we'll get there. The big themes going into this U.S. Open are the serious withdrawals from the old guard, Djokovic's march to a potential calendar year Grand Slam. I think those are the big stories. If your fave is over 35, chances are your fave is not playing this tournament. Yeah, they're in danger, girl. Federer, Nadal, Serena, Venus, Vavrinka, all not in New York. Plus Dominic Team, who's not old, but is also a big name who's pulled out. So if you were wondering, as we have at some point in the last few years, what will tennis look like? without any of these big names, this is a window. Yeah. A Sophia Kennan is out as well. After I did my little cheat sheet of the top eight seeds and their results over the past year or so, Kennan pulled out. She has COVID. It's a breakthrough COVID-19 infection because she is vaccinated. She made sure to make very clear, I am vaccinated, mm-hmm. but I still got COVID. We talked earlier in the episode yesterday that the Open will not have a vaccination requirement for fans. As it turns out, they're not going to have a mask requirement either. So this is, this is a, it's a free for all. Yeah. I mean, we know that breakthrough infections happen. Everybody could be vaccinated and might still be passing around this Delta variant. So we hope it is a a largely uneventful Mm. two weeks for COVID But I don't know, man, like, you just need to do better than this. 
Top seed Ash Barty, she headlines the women's draw. There are many, many, many women who stand a shot at winning this tournament, as well as any number of women who we probably won't even talk about on this episode who could break through. Because one of the, the themes of women's tennis in the last couple of years has been this this semi-finalist out of nowhere. Right. We'll talk about the third quarter in a minute, which is the quarter of absolute chaos. But Ash Barty has, you know, the best form coming into this tournament. She's been giving an okay draw. Her third round opponent is potentially Kudar Matova. But I want to talk about that next section. No, 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 no. You're just blasting past (laughs) Clara Towson, who was one of my breakthrough picks of the year, who could face Barty in the second round. That could be tricky. Towson did win her first title this year. She's a big hitter. She opens against another Clara, Clara Burrell of France. Kuda Mertova would have to get through Kirstea if she were to reach her seeded third round. But, as I said, I do want to talk about that next section because, quite possibly, the most disrespectful first round, Mukhova and Cerebo Stormo. Mukhova recently retired from a match in Cincinnati with an ab injury. Can you think of a more annoying player to have to play in your mm-hmm. first round than Sarah? Well, this is something she's carried since Australia. Mm-hmm. That's when that injury originated, and it's hampered her all year. I don't know if I would say disrespectful. <laughs> I mean, under normal circumstances, this is one to watch, but not... Right, right. Cerebo Stormo is just a very difficult player. She will grind you into the ground if necessary. Mm-hmm. Like, she will drag you around the court for three hours. And if Carolina wins that, she might have to play Shia Sue in the next round. Another player you don't want to play if you're nursing mm-hmm. an injury. And then... Last year's semi-finalist, Jen Brady, in the third round. Jen Brady, who then built on that and went to the final in Australia this year. That feels like forever ago. Yeah, yeah. Naomi Osaka beating Jen Brady in the final of the Australian Open. That was this year. But again, another question mark in Ash Barty's section. Because, you know, what is up with Jen Brady lately? She, She hasn't played a lot. She's been injured. It's really hard to get a sense of what her form is at the moment. Mm-hmm. So, Barty's fourth round opponent, your guess is as good as mine. And then there's Belinda Bencic and Jessica Pagula and Jill Teichman and Igor Sviantek in that next little section of the top half. So, Bencic is the gold medalist at the Olympics. Jessica Pagula is putting together a great year for herself. Annette Contivate is actually the seed who is slotted to reach the third round, but Jill Teichman is there mm-hmm. to spoil the party. Pegula is currently ranked top 10 in the race to somewhere. We really? don't even know where the really? race is heading to, but yeah. The race to the WTA finals yes. in some place. Iga is still figuring things out on hard court. She's a titleist on hard courts this year. She is. Her form hasn't been great, put it that way. I don't think it's necessarily hard courts, but she didn't really come through the summer stretch with flying colors right she won rome emphatically she reached the quarterfinals of roland garros and uh we'll see so if you go by seeding the top quarter it's between or amongst barty brady benchich sviantek not bad it's not a cakewalk but it's also not the worst it could be for a number one seed carolina pliskova as we mentioned earlier she's back up to number four she gets her own quarter in a grand slam draw Maybe this is a kiss of death that I'm now throwing her way. But I feel like if Pliskova is to win a Grand Slam, this is <laughs> as good a shot as she's got. Okay, like we've said had... this. Like, she's had easy draws that have been... No, no, no. I'm not even talking about easy draws. I'm talking about the form that she's coming mm-hmm. in with. The fact that she had struggles to start the year. She's worked on a lot of stuff. She stayed the course. She's been a runner-up multiple times this year but she's also a former u.s open finalist yes so okay she lost to georgie in the final in canada but this is a different level of experience right carolina has been here before she's been to multiple grand slam finals just being the runner-up at wimbledon a few weeks ago and i think that 
if she met someone like Teichman or Georgie or, you know, anyone who's really on a roll, it's a different kind of test at mm-hmm. the U.S. Open. And with Pleshkova, there are definite holes in this section of the draw that you could see her benefiting from. What is Bianca Andreescu going to be doing? She's the other top seed in that section. But do we expect Bianca Andreescu to be making the quarterfinals? Yeah, so we'll get there in a second, but that is not an easy road for her. Pliskova could play Mardich in the third round. There's a potential matchup between Badosa and Pavlyuchenkova. By the way, Nastia just got her U.S. visa, so she will be playing in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Open. Finally. There's Sakari there. There's Kvitova. <sighs> Kvitova is like... S- One of the I biggest I wild no cards idea. in all of tennis yes. right now. She could lose in the first round. She could get to the semis, the final. I have no idea. New York is not... No, nope. exactly her strong suit. Historically, However, it has not been. she has the potential to play well anywhere. And if the weather in New York is anything like it's a projected to be in Toronto two weeks oh, from Lord. now, or even in the next week and a half, it's going to be cooler temperatures. Oh, is it? I So it's been like 90 and humid yeah, this week. No, no, week, the so. temperature is going to be falling, but then you find yourself playing under the roof at Ash, and then those are different conditions as well. The temperature might not be as high, but with the humidity, who knows? Mm. I'm just saying we've gone through a scorching stretch of North American heat with tennis recently. <laughs> yes. And I, it doesn't look like that's going to be the initial situation at the U.S. Open. Mm-hmm. And some people are used to these conditions and will flourish in super hot and humid weather because they're supremely fit. Mm. Wild card. Not an actual wild card, but a wild card in this draw. Amanda Nisimova, she plays Pliskova potentially in the second round. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can look at this draw on either the top or bottom half of the women's draw and say one part is necessarily easier than the others. I think there's definitely a case to be made that the bottom half is stronger, more packed, more loaded. But with such parity on the WTA Tour, there's a lot of interesting matches all throughout. There are. I think there are a lot more interesting first round matchups in the bottom half, but I do want to point out Andreescu Golubic. So Andreescu is the number six. We are waiting to be unburdened of these 2019 points because Andreescu, I mean, she's just, she's not had a great year. She hasn't played that much. She was the runner up in Miami. And then since then she's won four matches and she's lost seven. So that's not to say that Bianca can't light up, especially at a big tournament, especially one where she has good memories. But she did not get an easy walkover first round here. Golubic is having a career year, having reached the quarterfinals at Wimbledon. She's the Olympic silver medalist in doubles, and she's reached two finals this year. You're just intent on not pronouncing her name the way Bianca wants it pronounced, right? You're like, I am going to pronounce both those E's. Oh. (laughs) She was just trying to make it easier for us. Oh my god. Anyway, so according to Seed, Pliskova versus Pavlichenkova and Kvitova versus Andrescu. I think I can go out on a limb and say that this is not going to happen in this section. Oh, okay. Not with uh, Gladiatress Sakari in that section. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be crazy to see a women's draw where the one, two, three, four seeds all go to the semis? I think it could very feasibly happen on the top half. Yeah, Barty could. and Pliskova. Mm-hmm. Other first round matches of note, Barty against Zvonareva. Vera still out here doing the hard work, ranked inside the top 100. Shelby Rogers, Madison Brengel, Serana Kirste against Kudemirtova. Sakari opens against Kostyuk. Mm-hmm. On the bottom half. Arena Sabalenka is the number two seed at the very bottom of the draw, and the number three seed is Naomi Osaka. Three and five are in that third quarter, Ilina Svitolina and Osaka, and then you have number two and number eight in the very last quarter, Barbora Krejcikova. Okay, let's talk about this third quarter, because this is the one that people are talking about. Basically, all of the black women are in the same quarter. And the first round matchups here are absolutely chaotic. Mm -hmm. This is why the U.S. Open should do the draws in public, because people are already saying rigged. 
I do wonder why they just release the draws because they clearly don't care that much about COVID, right? Yeah. So they could do a live draw behind closed doors, but film it, maybe get a little advertising revenue. Not much, but a little. Why not? It's more fun. Nothing about draw ceremonies is fun. Nothing about it. But for me. <laughs> the point is, it's about, it's about trans- transparency. Yes. Yes. That's what it's about. You were doing a bit too much there just now. I was trying to talk it up, you know, in case the US Open needed any good reasons to do a draw ceremony. And there has never been a draw ceremony that has been lauded. <laughs> it's right. always one of the biggest complaints of a Grand Slam. Yeah. There's always going to be something to complain about. Mm. But the bottom line, the m- most important thing, which often seems to be the least regarded thing by the organizers, is transparency. Because people are going to talk. In the month of September, year 2021, you're going to put all the black women in one quarter? <laughs> right. Under these circumstances where it's done behind closed doors and nobody's able to have a second set of eyes on it? Like, that's just not good optics. Right. So let's start at the top here. We've got Olympic bronze medalist Alina Svitolina facing off against a qualifier. On the other part of that section, Kazatkina in Pirankova. That could be a great first round. Pirankova is the quarterfinalist here from 2020. Dasha has really, you know, put together a great year and has changed the course of her career. Mm -hmm. Simona Halep is coming back from injury. The last match she played, she had to withdraw from. Like, this is not uh, a stable Simona Halep. Right. She was recovering from this calf tear that took her out of Roland Garros and Wimbledon. The Olympics. She said she had another small tear, and she was trying to take it easy and be prudent before the U.S. Open. She didn't compete badly no. in her first tournament back. No. She lost, but, it you know, it wasn't bad. So if Simona is healthy and is ready to compete... You know, who knows what happens? Yeah, it's but, tough to imagine seven matches, though, at the US well, Open. Well, exactly. And considering she's opening against Montreal champion Camila Georgi. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just talking about getting through the first round. This is tough. <laughs> this is someone who's coming in with a whole load of confidence now. And who could, if Simona is not feeling up to it, could hit you off the court. Mm-hmm. But it's not just that all the black women are in the same quarter. It's that they're in the same round of 16. Yes. So you've got Svitolina and Simona highlighting that round of 16 to start the bottom half. And then you've got Angelique Kerber opening against Diana Yastremsko. Okay, okay, okay. (laughs) And I I have to laugh. I will be watching that one. Mm. Then you've got Madison Keys opening against Sloane Stevens, the winner of which will play likely Coco Goff. Granted, Coco opens against Magda Lynette, which is not a foregone conclusion. Madison and Sloan sounds familiar because they were the 2017 finalists and because they're friends. Sloan has a better record against Madison. That Grand Slam should have been Venus Williams defeating Madison Keys in the final, but that's something I'll take yep. to my grave. Yep. But, you know, but, at some point, I'm going to have to get over it. But it happened, and both of these players are unseated, and they're facing off in the first round to go on and play possibly Coco Golf, uh, to possibly play another U.S. Open champion in the next round in Kerber. Now, if Goff gets through that, which he's shown a propensity to be consistent at the third round, round of 16 level in tournaments recently and Grand Slams, she could face Naomi Osaka in the fourth round. Yeah. Uh, so Naomi just beat her in Cincinnati. She's beaten her at the U.S. Open before in a very famous match. She has also lost very badly Spectacular, to Coco. Spectacular. Just a, a really bad match from in Naomi. In Australia. Yeah. Now, Naomi, she thinks she's not far from her best form. She just hasn't had a lot of practice no. over the past few I mean, She may have had a lot of practice. She just well, hasn't had a lot of match time. Right. She says she's feeling like she's not that far off. And if Naomi says something like that at the U.S. Open, I am inclined to believe her because Mm -hmm. of her amazing results at this tournament. Mm -hmm. So by seeding, it's Svitolina against Halep in the round of 16 and Goff against Osaka. Right. That's a lie. It would, by (laughs) seeding, it would be Kerber against Osaka, but, you know, Kerber or Goff against Osaka. Right. 
And I don't want to miss here, we didn't mention Rybakina. We didn't mention the possibility of the Olympic silver medalist, Vondrosova, getting through. She would have to beat one of Kazatkina or Peronkova, but she could feasibly be in the third or fourth round. And we're talking about this draw with none of the qualifiers having been placed. Right, so Typic- I, I don't even want to know who they are. Typically, we wait until the qualifiers have been placed, but we're having house guests for the first time in 18 months since this weekend. B- since before you ever heard the word COVID-19. <laughs> Your parents are coming this weekend. Yeah. So um, we are kind of going into this blindly with respect to qualifiers. And we know two things about qualifiers. they are going to be names who have had results in their past, who mm-hmm. then pose a specific threat to certain players when they're placed in the draw. And also, these qualifiers have won three matches. They show up in the first round with three wins under their belt, and a lot of times, a bunch of momentum. So, we're talking about this, but it could be a lot more treacherous in actuality. Right. So, suffice it to say, this third quarter is chock full of dark horses, first of all. It's also got three former U.S. Open champions just in Naomi Osaka's little section there. In Mm -hmm. Kerber, Naomi, and Sloan. It has former runner-ups at the U.S. Open, and it has Coco Mm Gauff. I get all the talk about this quarter, but for me, and you can look at my draw right now that I made notes on, this fourth quarter, I did a little bracket around all the players, and I put, what did I put? Wow. Wow. Yeah, I (laughs) I think this is... If you look at the round three matchups from this quarter, this is where it's at for me. Okay, okay, tennis hipster. No, 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 no. You're not being swayed by the third quarter gossip. I'm not. You've got Krejcikova against Alexandrova, Azarenka against Muguruza, Mertens against Jabur, and then, if this match happens, it's going to be the rumble in the jungle, the shot heard around the world, Daniel Collins against Irina Sabalenka. <laughs> Like, there's a lot of good stuff there here. There is, yeah. So those are the third round, the potential third rounds that you were reading out. Krejcikova, like we said, she has not missed. Her year in singles alone, surprisingly, she's at this point now where she's a top 10 player, a Grand Slam champion. Who would have picked that at the start of the year? But when you combine it with her doubles, <laughs> right. a three-time singles titleist in 2021, and then her doubles prowess. Right. This I, is one of the most well-rounded tennis players going right now, period. Yeah, we were doing our due diligence uh, before this episode. And I like to do like a rundown of the top eight seeds and how they've performed at the U.S. Open and what they've been doing lately. Mm-hmm. So her best result is the third round of qualifying. Way back in 2014, she has no main draws and singles at this tournament. But... Like, so what else has Krejcikova been up to this year? Obviously, we know she won Roland Garros, Wimbledon round of 16. Oh, also, very you know, very minor. She won four doubles titles, including Roland Garros, the Olympics, and the mixed title at the Australian Open. There is, I mean, she is the most successful player this year across singles and doubles. Mm-hmm. You just mentioned this, this nice little nifty spreadsheet that you do. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting here trying to figure out whether you're trying to trick me, uh, lay a trap, and see what I would do. Because under the comment section for Karolina Pliskova, you have that she's yet to beat a top 10 player at a Grand Slam. (laughs) That was a copy and paste error. Uh, That was referring to that guy that we don't speak Uh of. And it was just, you know. He has a very specific name that you use for him when we're making notes for the show. That yes. I will not repeat right now. It is an animal. It's three I'll letters. I'll give you that. Yeah. Three letters. Mm-hmm. Anyway. My trust levels in your research is, is, is it's lagging right now because of that. <laughs> Fair enough. So Krejcikova opens against a qualifier. Mladenovic and Kanta uh, is an exciting first round, possibly, in that little section. Sarah Irani is back, you know, got a direct entry back in the first round here against Alexandrova. Evika Azarenka, you know, I really, I don't know how to call this. She's been a little bit hit and miss lately. She took a bad loss to Barty, and I mean, a lot of people have recently. But I'm just not getting that 
feeling from her mm. that it's an, you know another run to the finals or i mean these players have bouts of form in spurts mm-hmm. at the yeah. start of the year muguruza was unbeatable almost she was in impregnable form now she suffered an injury and it's it's hit or miss mm-hmm. a lot of misses lately yeah but then you get a third round matchup between vika and, and muguruza and that could be a catalyzing win for either of them yeah absolutely Vika is historically more successful at this tournament. She's been in three finals. Muguruza's best result here is a fourth round. Mm-hmm. Really, it's not her favorite slam. So I I honestly hope that those two face off in the third round because I think it'll be a very interesting matchup. Muguruza also had very little success at Cincinnati until she won it. The, exactly. I mean, we yeah. know she can play on hard court. So. She's the kind of player who sometimes upends uh expectations mm. and can win titles at big events and just like crap out at smaller ones jabur is there as well somebody who's also had an incredible 2021 there are a lot of names here if you go by the ranking the round of 16s would be muguruza against krejcikova and sabalenka against mertens the men's draw is headlined by novak djokovic co 20 time grand slam champion alongside roger federer and rafael nadal with those other two gentlemen mia at the u.s open novak djokovic is the only one with a chance to get to 21 at this tournament yeah well that's that's the first little bit the second not so little bit is that he's won the other three slams this year so this is his chance for a calendar year slam he went after the golden calendar slam that didn't happen losing at the olympics but now he arrives in new york looking to break the all-time record and also achieve this calendar slam that has not happened on the atp tour since rod laver did at this very start of the open era Mm -hmm. no doubt the olympics were a huge disappointment for novak so part of kind of setting your mind right is getting past that he didn't play any lead-up tournaments to the u.s open which is very unusual for him and this draw is feeling a bit like novak and the seven dwarfs which you may know was a very uncharitable coinage uh from the 90s when a reporter called the women's tours steffi graf and the seven dwarfs that sounds like christine brennan was it i don't i knew at one point which writer did and i think we talked about it in our steffi episode but This is the future. This is Novak versus the future. And a lot of these young players are untested. Okay, we're going to do this part a little bit differently. (laughs) I'm going to put you on the spot. Who are the people who can beat Novak? Mm -hmm. Let's start there. Well, who are the people who can beat Novak in best of five? And I don't don't know who they are. Where are they? I'll rephrase the question. (laughs) Who are the people who could challenge Novak feasibly? Uh Uh-huh. Medvedev. Okay. To me is is kind of the number one. And, and I think he's somebody who would most relish playing the spoiler. And he's actually number two yeah. on the bottom half of the draw. So they would not meet until the final if they both won their first six matches. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I mean, this isn't revolutionary here, right? On Novak's side of the draw, the guy who potentially could do it or could challenge him is somebody we don't want to see winning anything. That guy. That guy. Okay. Right? Out of everyone here. But I what there, I, I think there are a couple other people. Berrettini. Yes. Maybe. But on hard court, uh, I don't know. Maybe. It it all depends on Novak's form, really. He's, I, he's nursing an injury. Right? He, he took off the summer hard court tournaments to get his body right for this monumental ask that he's going to be undertaking Mm -hmm. and despite being a wizard on hard courts he has only won the u.s open three times and i know it sounds ridiculous to say only three times but by his standards it's a little bit low i mean nadal has won more u.s opens than Djokovic, so that puts that into perspective it is surprising Mm -hmm. now i think he's been given a draw where a lot of the really difficult guys are going to take each other out Mm-hmm. Because somebody who I would say could challenge him is Urkacz, but then he has to get past Berrettini mm-hmm. in the fourth round to then play Novak in the quarterfinals. 
in Novak's uh, section, we've got Gonfin as the third round seeded opponent, or Nishikori. Uh, Gonfin has to open against Mackenzie McDonald, who had a great tournament at Washington, I believe. And I, w- I was looking up, oh, Nishikori could be tough. And then I was like, oh, wait, no. No. No, their head-to-head is 17-2. and two. Well, not only that, <laughs> Nishikori only plays five-set matches in the first week of Grand Slams. Right, that's, right. That's all he does. <laughs> and so by the time he gets to his very consistent, well, in his prime, his very consistent round of 16 quarterfinal stage, he's gassed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Karatsev uh, is the number 21 seed. Serious downswing on his year after Indeed. the great start. Yeah. Diminar, haven't really heard from much from him lately. Maybe there's somebody like Sonigo, who could, the Karate Kid, who could catch fire again. <laughs> Jensen Brooksby is in that little section, uh, could get through if Alex or Taylor Fritz kind of fizzle out. The I mean, Demonauer's first round against Taylor Fritz is not easy, right? Demonauer won Eastbourne back in June, and he's recorded a single win since mm. then. Two guys who could make deep runs here, they get, get bunched together in the same little section. Sebastian Cordo and Lorenzo Muzzetti, both unseeded, but Corda would have to play Pablo Carreño Busta in the second round, and Muzzetti would have to play Opelka in the second round to then potentially play each other in the third round. That's tough. Oh, we're down in the second quarter now. We're doing more big picture for this. It's not as granular. (laughs) Okay. My point is, to what you were saying, a lot of the guys who you could maybe see be dark horses or making deep runs, they eliminate themselves. Right, right. Or each other. Yeah. Yannick Sinner obviously is someone to watch. He's only ever reached the first round at the U.S. Open, but he is so young that it's just not really a good gauge no. of what he's going to do. You saw, you corrected me about eliminating each other, but somebody who could eliminate himself and has been eliminating himself since Wimbledon is Denis Shapovalov. Had he been able to maintain that form into the hardcourt season you could you could easily see him making a deep run here but we just don't know right right he's the number seven seed down here he could face karen hachanov in the third round it gets tougher well it gets it gets a little harder to predict past mm. that third round because pablo carino busta was a semifinalist here last year uh there is corda as you said there's ugh, basilashvili Opelka, who just reached the final in Canada. I have no idea who gets through that section. Mm-hmm. By seeding, the round of 16s looked like Nole versus Deminar, Urkacz against Berrettini, that guy against Sinner, Karenio Busta against Chapovalov. On the bottom half of the draw. Oh, you're just flying through I'm the I'm flying. Draw. I'm flying. We mentioned that's where Daniel Medvedev headlines, where he is you claim to be Djokovic's main antagonist opponent challenger at this event. He and Stefano Tsitsipas are the top two seeds in the bottom half. Tsitsipas has Andrei Rublev as his potential quarterfinal opponent, and Medvedev has Kaspar Ruud. Let's just talk about a few first-round matchups in this bottom half, because Tsitsipas drew Andy Murray in the first round. And... This uh, this sucks more, really, for Murray you, because it's this is actually disrespectful. It is indeed. Andy is obviously not at the level that he would like to be. He believes he's playing like a top sixty player right now. But Stefanos, if Stefanos brings his game, should should win this match easily. Mm-hmm. Stefanos has still not be, reached beyond the third round at the U.S. Open, mm-hmm. and last year he had that stunner. Of a loss against George. Yes, that was emotional. It was petulant. And I think he is still susceptible to Mm -hmm. people, well, people insinuating that he's cheating, first of all. But he can mentally go off the rails sometimes. And a lot of times that doesn't mean that he loses the match. But he has lapses or, you know, he's screaming at his box. And it doesn't always appear that it's helping. So what are you saying? I feel like you're just going off on a tangent. Okay, I'm saying that it's... Can an... Mori beat him? Well, I mean, anything can happen. Do I think it's likely? Probably not. 
is there anybody in this bottom half that can challenge Djokovic should they make it to the final outside of Medvedev? I, I don't know. I guess Stefanos or Andre Rublev are really the only other options. I feel like Rublev is not quite there yet. He had a breakthrough getting to the final in Cincinnati and then was dismantled. Mm. Um, John Isner? That's a joke. Obviously. Before we get there, there are some other interesting things happening here. Bautista opens against Kyrgios. Nick's... Uh, the thing, like, so Nick pulled out of Winston Salem at the very last minute. His body is just not right. Like, he's not fit. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you, I don't know, like, you watch Nick for entertainment value, but if he wanted to commit himself to the sport, he would. Uh, and Bautista has seven hard court titles to his name. He has, <laughs> I mean, there's no reason he shouldn't come through to the third round and face Felix. He's had a few losses in a row to Djokovic, and he's had a few instances where he was expected to challenge Djokovic and didn't quite get there. And so the sheen off of Bautista Good as Dark Horse and Bugaboo for Djokovic has... It's gone away. Yeah, yeah. Because I feel like he'd be one of the obvious choices even a year ago. Right. Francis Tiafo is unseated, is a dangerous floater for Andre Rublev, Francis is feeling himself this week in North Carolina, and he's had some big wins. Obviously, that that huge one at Wimbledon beating uh, Tsitsipas. If he beats Krajinovich, he could get to the third round and give Andre uh, a difficult time. Mm-hmm. The third quarter, by seeding Rublev against Felix Auger-Alessim, Christian Garin against Tsitsipas. I do not expect Garin to make the round of 16. However, the last time I said that about Garin, he did that. Yeah. So. And he's got a pretty soft draw. Well, I mean, Ugo Umber is there as well. Mm -hmm. He'd be the one that I'd expect to get to that round of 16. Cam Nori opens against Carlos Alcaraz. That's not not easy Mm -hmm. at this present time. Mm -hmm. Casper Ruud, his first top eight seed, and he is facing my guy, Joe Wilfried Songa. Mm -hmm. I don't think, unfortunately, Songa is in that place in his career where he wins this match. Uh, but I, I'm going to savor what, who knows, it could be the last appearance in New York for Songa. Now, uh, this is not the most exciting section of the draw. <laughs> I am so bored by this. Is, it's, Isner, it's so painful Isner and right Schwartzman now. could be a, a third round, which... Really, the only intrigue there is the many video packages you'll see making jokes about the height difference. They've actually only played once in Isner 1. Yes, you should not expect Joe Wilfred Songa to win that match. I'm glad you've made peace with it. I, I have. The other seeded players in this section, Dimitrov, Evans, Marin Cilic, and of course, Daniel Medvedev. And I will say, Medvedev doesn't need the help. On hard courts, but this is a, a pretty soft quarter for him. You've got a former U.S. Open champion in the run of 32 in Marin Cilic. There are not many of those outside of the big four that have okay. done that. Okay, fair enough. And Cilic has been resurgent. That Twitter account that says, did Marin Cilic win? It has been saying yes a lot more recently. <laughs> I'd like to see Dimitrov make a run. He's owed a little bit of Grand Slam luck based on what's happened to him with injury in particular in the last year or so. There's there's really not that much to say about this section. <laughs> John Isner opens against Nakashima. Maybe Nakashima can do the business. Fell a tree. Yeah, I find the lately the men's draws at majors are more interesting to me once they actually start going. It's just, it's so hard to, to look at this draw cold and say, oh, this is going to be interesting. This, because it does feel like the champions are a foregone conclusion. By seeding Kaspar Ruud against Diego Schwartzman in the round of 16 and Grigor Dimitrov against Daniil Medvedev. I mean, I do not pick Tsitsipas to come out of this and make the final. I just don't. Mm. Mm. It's got to be Medvedev or, I mean, can... Has Rublev shown himself to be a best of five king yet? I don't, not quite. I'm, I don't I think don't so. I don't trust that. And where do you put your money on Felix breaking through? 
We've been hoping for that, but he's still only 20. Schwartzman, you're probably looking at a tree of some sort. Yes, yes. And if you're looking for someone to challenge Djokovic, it probably is a tree. I'm so happy the draws are done. It's the least favorite thing I do on this show. I was laboring through that last bit of it. Okay, you got to pretend a little better for the listening audience. That's normally what I say to you, but it's my <laughs> bandwidth, man. Right now, it's just, we're moving on. Yeah. So, obviously, this is a more difficult topic. It's not exactly fun to talk about. But the second part of Ben Rothenberg's story on Olya Sharapova's allegations against Alexander Zverev came out in Slate yesterday. And uh, we wanted to give ourselves a day just to kind of read it a few times and think about it. You may have noticed earlier this week that the ATP sent a press release announcing that they were going to be undertaking this safeguarding review. They were going to be working with some expert consultants to produce a report on how to safeguard their athletes and people associated with tennis, uh, you know, essentially including things like domestic violence. Mm. So when that came out, I was like, okay, they must know that this article is dropping. Mary Carrillo had told us on air, I think during the Olympics, that she'd read it and that it was going to be published. And lo and behold, a few days later, the story has dropped. And in that story, Ben Rothenberg writes, the ATP did not make any officials available for interviews on this topic, but inquired several times about the timing of this article's publication. That is, that is one of many parts of this story that stuck out to me. Yeah. Alarm bells just went off immediately when I read that. Because they've clearly not taken any steps to a, investigate this themselves, the ATP. Now they're forming this exploratory thing to come up with something maybe possibly down the road to safeguard something. It's all very vague. It's a lot of, uh, what do you call it? Word... Word salad. Word salad. But it is, listen, but it is something, right? This is being undertaken to produce a report. And even before the report has been made, they said publicly that they have a commitment to ensure all adults and minors involved in professional tennis are safe and protected from abuse. So there is an agenda that's driving this review process, and they expect to have a report done at some point in Q4. So it's not nothing, but the ATP seems to have been content to sit on the sidelines and watch how this was all playing out for months, at least from where we're sitting. Right, but if the answer to those questions had been, well, the, the article is not going to be published, would the response have been, well, we're just going to sit on our asses as we've been doing? It, it may have, and if you take historical evidence, that would probably be a pretty good educated guess. Now, the story did a good job at laying out some of the difficulties that an organization like the ATP might have in creating a domestic abuse policy, the fact that they're, they're quite different from leagues like the NHL or the NFL. They work with independent contractors. They're uh, nomadic, in Ben's words, which can make it difficult because things happen in many different jurisdictions across the world. Mm. So I, I get it, but... But the, Ben also makes the point that that's a crutch almost. Yes. Because yes. you could move on that and act on that from a point of strength to send the, to then say we have jurisdiction over our players, regardless of the fact that they're quote-unquote independent contractors. Right. That's been the thing that's been regurgitated to tell us, well, we can't, we can't do anything. Roger Federer said that. Well, you know, it's difficult because players, they're independent contractors, but the bottom line is the ATP is the governing body of men's tennis. So, like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? And as Ben pointed out, and as we have mentioned since the first story came out last fall, there actually are rules in place on the ATP under which something like this could be investigated. The rule about conduct contrary to the integrity of the game, for example. The ATP already does investigate players for a number of things that aren't directly related to the playing of the game. Mm -hmm. So that infrastructure may in some way already be there. Mm -hmm. I thought this article was incredibly well written and kudos to Ben Rothenberg for 
finally getting it out, getting it published, the reasons for which it hadn't been done so till now are myriad, I imagine. One of which we know is because that guy Zverev has thrown his lawyers full force against this story, trying to get it stifled. Mm -hmm. I think as this is published, as more quote-unquote important people are talking about this in tennis, it becomes more and more difficult to to uh, use that dog whistle that this is just a he said, she said. Because, you know, that phrase is used to diminish the accounts of survivors all the time. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it is demonstrably not a he said, she said, right? This is a two stories now that have gone to print that have had to fight with lawyers that have had to deal with the threats of libel and defamation suits, I'm sure, if... A, it, a publication like Slate does not take this lightly. No. They've vetted this story. They've done their corroborations. It's gone through legal. Like The fact yeah. that it's seen the light of day should be a signal to you that this is not smoke and mirrors. Right. And you can say, well, this is only Olia's version. Well, it's Olia's version along with other witnesses who have been interviewed... A publication like Slate has a fact-checking mechanism. There are WhatsApp messages. There's photos. And, and again, they're at no point, because journalists have to be careful, at no point does the author say, this is what definitely happened. It's always, this is what is alleged to have happened. This is what Olia said happened to her. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know what it takes to get a story like this to print. And that's fine if you don't know. But if you don't know and you're being extremely loud about how this is just one person's account and it could be fake, you clearly don't understand the workings of journalism. You also don't understand that this is only, quote-unquote, one person's account because Verb has refused to answer any of the allegations, other than to say, blanketly, they're false. So he's been asked about it. And he's decided not to. That's on him. That shouldn't be used as a means to discredit Olya Sharapova and her story. He could easily, if it were false, counter her claims. And he's chosen not to. What he's chosen to do is rely on the fact, the fact, the historical fact, that the tennis establishment, that societies in general, will do the work for him. That they will have... The ATP doing nothing until now. They will have Tennis TV continue to promote him. They will have Billie Jean King congratulating him on winning titles. His peers will tell us that, oh, I don't have anything to say about this. I cannot comment. But in the same breath, go to great lengths to tell us how much of a good guy he is to them. All these little but not so little things that he can just count on that are built into the system to prop him up and discount people who come forward with allegations of domestic abuse. Right. I and mean, th that's what he's done. He and teammate parted ways, but Roger Federer still says Sasha's a great guy. And that's very personal stuff that I don't want to get into. Novak Djokovic says, stay strong. Uh, okay. There are so many systems in place to protect someone like Zverev. He's wealthy. People think he's attractive. He's white, successful. And the messed up thing is, is he's playing some of the best tennis of his career after all these awful allegations came out. Well, didn't you know there are people out there who want to wipe the smile off his oh, yes. face? Yes. But yet he still smiles under it. You just can't see it. Yeah. It's, I think those are the lyrics of Tears of a Clown. Um, I mean, this is sociopathic behavior. And the thing that rings true to me from reading this second account, this part two of Sharapova's story, is that we recognize this kind of behavior in many ways. Like the, the little subtle things that abusers do and say to kind of rub it in your face, that they know they can get away with it. Mm. That nobody will believe you, my position and my reputation will protect me and i'm just going to play in your face just because i can and i'm going to enjoy it you're not going to be able to see the smile under my mask but it's there mm -hmm. so if it's not true sue her 
Seuss light. Right. Um, and, you know, I just think it requires maybe a little critical thought from folks who are determined to believe that this is all bullshit. Because what does Olia gain from this? Like, what, <laughs> when have false accusers gained something material from making false accusations? She's not asking for money. She hasn't pressed charges. I can't imagine that this is helping her career prospects. She told uh, us in that story that she's gone up for jobs in Russia and things were going well. And once they did some digging and found out that she'd brought these allegations forward, that companies are like, well, no, I, I want nothing to do with that because they foresee trouble. She's going to be a trouble right, for them right. in the future. So continue to go on with the misogynistic terms like gold digger, but where is the evidence for that? Mm -hmm. what, where is the gold? Meanwhile, she's the one who's actually suffered. Zverev, speaking of gold, just signed a deal with Rolex. Right. Gold watch is like... <laughs> yeah. And Rolex is out here in this article saying, well, we're, we're fine. We're, we're aware of stuff that has been said, but we're, we're fine. Mm -hmm. So... You know, credit to people like uh, Darren Cahill, Mary Carrillo, uh, the very few folks who do tennis media who have been talking about this now on international TV. I think the conversation is going to get a lot louder over the next few weeks, and I'm sure there'll be more to come about this. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really shitty subject, to be honest. But it is, uh, you know, commendable that Olia felt comfortable sharing the story and that it was done in a really responsible way. And there's a time gap here. The first story was given, was published last fall into the winter. And it's been, what, 10 months since then? Her mm. account hasn't changed. She, she hasn't reneged on anything. She hasn't, as we say in Jamaica, catch our afraid. And we're like, well, no, actually I changed my mind. I'm not going to stand by that anymore. She's like, yeah, I still stand by it. This is what I'm saying. And this is what I've been through in that in the interim. Mm-hmm. And there's new information in the story mm -hmm. that we didn't know previously. Because so, it, it cut off before, right after the Labor Cup, mm -hmm. right? So I think what you're getting into next is there's really no reason that Ben has to be the only journalist covering the story. No. And he hinted at that today when he tweeted about what's next. And he said, well, soonest on the horizon, Zverev is one of the top players scheduled to have a press conference during the U.S. Open Media Day tomorrow, which is Friday. The episode, this episode will be out by then, so we won't be covering that. If anything does happen, we'll cover it on our mid-US Open episode. He says, other reporters will have ample opportunity to take the baton and ask the questions which he declined to answer for the slate piece, such as, how does he respond to each of the incidents which Sharapova described in detail, and also provided corroborating evidence for, mind you? Would he support an investigation by the ATP into the accusations? And also, would he support the creation of an ATP domestic violence policy? To date, Ben is the only one who's been asking him these questions. Mm -hmm. And if, if Zerev is innocent, those things would actually help him. They would protect him. If there were an investigation and nothing came up, that's a way to clear your name. If there is a domestic violence policy, the person who is accused is also protected in that process. He's you know? always had the opportunity to give his side of the story and he's he's chosen not to do to do so until now he and if it's false to. if it's false sue it's as simple as that this is going to be our longest episode in history we wanted to talk about track and field because it's been an incredible summer in the women's 100 meter like historic stuff is happening constantly mm -hmm. right now it's the greatest show in sports the duo of elaine thompson hera and Shelly and Fraser Price, week to week now, are pushing each other to new limits. I'm I, So in Eugene at the Prefontaine Classic, it was the first big, big meet since the Olympics. It was billed as, you know, Shikari's return to elite competition. The Jamaicans, uh, I mean, they dusted the field. Demolished. Uh, it was an absolute demolition. Mm -hmm. Shelly and Fraser Price ran the slowest looking 10.73 seconds in <laughs> history because Elaine Thompson and Hera sped past her in 10.54. An absolutely unreal time. And now today, they're across the ocean in Lausanne, Switzerland, 
And uh, to my pleasant surprise, Shelly Ann Fraser Price, at the age of 34, runs a personal best of 10.60, mm-hmm. beating Elaine. Uh, Who ran 10.64? Right. Like, uh, these are pretty fast. <laughs> was there anybody else in the race? I mean, Sharika finished third. It was a third consecutive race where Jamaica finished one, two, three. Mm-hmm. But Sharika was a little bit further back this time at 10.92, I think. But uh, I mean, these two women are creating history now uh, everywhere they go. Do you want to touch on the Shakari Richardson stuff? Uh, I don't. I mean, because I was prepared to not say anything on this episode until I saw the tweet that she liked. Yeah, I. Well, that that is your prerogative. I don't really feel I need to add to the chorus about Shakari. I will just say that it it is simply not wise to make an enemy of Allison Felix because even Jamaicans like Allison Felix, like she is unhateable. Okay, but listen. All I can say is that from the jump, Shakira reminded me a lot of Azalea Banks. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's stuff about her and things that she says that endear you to her, but there's a lot of stuff that clearly comes from a place of deep hurt, that come from a place of instability in whatever facet. I don't, I don't know, I don't know her. But, like, there's a lot of popping off about things that need not happen. And it's alarming to me at some, for somebody who's 21 who has so much talent. This is not a case, yes, Shakira Richardson finished dead last at the Prefontaine Classic. Embarrassingly so for how it was built. That is a fact. But she's also ran 10-7 something four times. Yeah. More yeah. so than most women in the history of the sport at only 21. Like she has incredible talent. What is going on here? There is a lot of mess and noise that need not be happening. Like you throw an entire legendary Jamaican team under the bus. And then you lash out at Allison Felix, who's trying to uh, throw an olive branch. And then when these Jamaicans board the bus at turbo speed and run you over, like, <laughs> what, what, what did you expect? <laughs> like, and do you expect people to be granting you grace in these moments? And her supporters did her no favors because they displayed an atrocious level of ignorance about the track world, about the world in general around them by not knowing what was what. And they found out. Okay, go off. Did you want to mention the tweet, the xenophobic tweet that she liked about Jamaica? To tell, tell the listeners. Well, I mean, it, it really is your thing. You know, it was some stupid tweet about how Jamaicans don't wear shoes on the way to their job at the coconut stand. It's typical, like, diaspora war stuff, and it's best if we ignore it, but I understand why Jamaicans were particularly pissed off about that. I have nothing constructive to add no. to that that will not come from a place of rage. I'm sure you have a lot of destructive things to say about I it. I do, yeah. and I shine. And, you know... That is 100% your right. On that note, thank you for listening to this epistle. If an epistle were in audio form. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's gone on for oh, a while. Don't get me started on epistolary novels, because I'll won't. write a thesis. We are, we're not going to do that. Okay. I'm That's Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. I'm James at Elliot JMR. And this is The Body Two Surf. L's, two T's. Yeah, don't forget. This is The Body Surf. You know where to find us on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Till next time.